Welcome to Conscious Co-Creation Straight Talk about the mind, body, business, and spirit. I am really thrilled today because today we're going to be having a beautiful conversation with Judith Diana Winston. And however, we're going to be calling her Diana today because she loves that name. And I am so happy to have her with us here today. So welcome, Diana. Well, thank you, Carly. Happy. And to be I'm going to show my favorite book because she actually actually has written this beautiful book called The Keeper of the Diary. However, she, I'm going to show you two books. So the first book is called The Keeper of the Diary, and that's where we're going to be talking about this book. But I have to show you another book that she just sent me that I have to say is like my favorite book. Well, actually, it's part of the other book. But it's called The Meditative Magic, The Palladium Glyphs, okay, which is part of the other book. And we're going to be talking about both. But I just want to show you how beautiful they are. And the glyphs that are in here are absolutely magical. And so I'd, I'd love for her to share, to start with, I'd love to hear about your inspiration behind the primary big Bible here, because it is, it's like so thick, it's so beautiful. Share, share with us the inspiration behind the book. Well, okay. Um, I made two trips to Egypt in short succession after having never really been out of the United States. And the story about how it was that I happened to go and um, a lot of the things that happened on that trip, the two trips. Actually, I came back from the second trip and there was a story tugging on me. And so that was the genesis of what became the Keeper of the Diary. It also sent me, so that first trip to Egypt started a great curiosity for me about the ancient history of our planet and the, might say, the origins and the future of mankind. And I felt that a lot of the sacred sites around the world held information for me. And I ended up traveling for about 10 years. And all of that became a part of the story, my story, and then the things that I learned became a part of my heroine story. That's the keeper of the diary. Now, can you elaborate a little more on that? Can you actually tell us the main characters? I know you're actually in the book, in a way. So can you actually just share with the, the audience, like, who is the main character? And actually, who are you? Like, you are, in essence, the, one of the characters. So who do you play in the book? And then just actually share with the audience a little bit who are the main players in the book. And then obviously we're going to be talking, you know, we have 55 minutes to actually envelop the audience in the book, and we're actually going to be talking about a lot of things. We're talking about consciousness and, you know, just the layers of consciousness, if you will, and a lot, we're going to be talking about a lot of things. So it just gives people this kind of the lay of the land, a synopsis, if you will, that we'll, we'll, we will be talking about as we go. Okay, well, the quick version of the book is it's a story about a young woman named Cassie who ends up taking a job in to shoot a slideshow for a teacher in Egypt who's actually traveling to Egypt, Jordan, Israel, and Greece. And on about the second day of her trip, a diary mysteriously shows up in her camera case. And this diary kind of challenges everything she believes to be true. She, this is a trip with a spiritual teacher, and yet she's not in any way on a spiritual quest and questions herself deeply. Why did she even bother to come? Because the material in this diary, which she tries to give back but is unable to do, is so challenging for her and for her worldview, uh, as well as the teacher who is leading this group that oftentimes she just wants to, she tries to give it back and she can't. And oftentimes she just wishes she could throw it away, but there's something so compelling to the story. So she ends up reading it, and this ends up driving really the rest of the book. Um, it changes her life. It changes, it brings in things about herself that she would never have imagined. She learns things about her childhood that affect her life in such a deep way that it gives her a sense of purpose that she would have never imagined. And 
a lot of the book is concerned with her trying to find the person who wrote the diary, whose name is David. And she's kind of thwarted at every turn. But somehow she just feels in her heart that it's really important to give him the diary back. So she, that's part of what engenders her search to all of these sacred sites. So this is a story that works on many levels because here it's a heroine story. You know, it's somebody who leaves the ordinary world, the everyday world, where she's a fashion photographer and had been successful. And she suddenly feels like her life is, in a way, being taken over, not from her own conscious place. And this is very scary to her, that she's not in control. And yet the further she goes on this journey, the more she learns and the people that she meets, things begin to form a pattern. And slowly but surely, she comes to the conclusion that actually this diary had to be meant for her. So I don't want to talk about too many more details because that would give away some things that I think would be very exciting for the reader. But let me just say it's a story, it's a story of a spiritual quest by somebody who doesn't even know she's on a spiritual quest. So speaking of spiritual quests, I know you and I are, at least I know, speaking from my own personal experience, I, I tend to would believe that I, I am a person of a spiritual nature. So. And I know, as you know, that my title to my shows are always conscious co-creations, and and I know that in my in my reading of parts of the book and looking at the new book that you just sent me and the the Palladian glyphs and all that, what does conscious co-creations mean to you? Well, I think that um, we're all co-creators. That's just kind of the way energy works and the way life on planet Earth works. But it takes it to another level to be a conscious creator and that means taking responsibility for the things in your life, even the things that might not be working. It's not about blame, but it's about responsibility because once you take responsibility, then you can change things. If you feel like they're just happening to you, which really Cassie does in the beginning of the book, she feels very much sort of victimized by a lot of things in her life. And as we go on the journey with her and she begins to see that that's not really how things are working, it empowers her in ways that she would never imagine. And so she does become a conscious creator. And I think that's really where we all are headed. And so that's kind of where I was going. You know, the, the spiritual journey and the quest, and you've traveled a lot. So in all your experiences of traveling and being at these really amazing places, you're experiencing these energies at these different pyramids. What was your own, and that, that's why I want to, you know, you did put some of your own personal journeys into this book. And I'm, so I'm going to ask you, though, how did these trips and going on this journey, how did it impact your own personal life? Like literally, how do you feel that going on all these journeys and being at all these sacred sites, how did it affect your own personal life? Well, it changed it completely. Uh, like Cassie, before I went on this my first trip to Egypt, I was a fashion photographer, and um, I was very sort of embroiled in that world and thought that my greatest dream would be to have my work in Vogue magazine. And then I went on the trip, uh, in my case two trips, and I began to view life in a much larger and broader way, enough so just from those two trips to Egypt, that I ended up spending almost 10 years traveling around to a lot of the other ancient megalithic sites around the planet, looking trying to understand. These places are so mysterious. Modern science still doesn't really understand how they could have even been built. And when you start looking at questions like that, it gives you a different sense about our history here on the planet. Because, you know, we're sort of taught that we were hunters and gatherers and, and we sort of built up, you know, our, our knowledge over time till we finally became who we are today. But when you look at these ancient sites, you go, wait a minute, 
whoever built these sites knew something big. And so it begins to give you a bigger and, and broader history and feeling about who we humans are and how long we might have been on the planet. Looking at those pyramids, I mean, at least from my point of view, I personally, there's no way that they could have built those pyramids with trinkets. I mean, with with a tool that was a hammer that was made from a rock, or or even leverage systems with the pulley systems. I mean, these 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 stones. There's, I don't know. I like you are more from a mindset that beings much more intelligent than us, or or even uh, could it be, you know, I, I have no issue believing that there could be aliens or people from another planet that could have built something a lot, uh, you know, I have no no qualms with beings from another planet having, having inhabited our Earth. At least, you know, I have no issue with that. So that that's another question for you. W what are your thoughts on there being beings from another planet inhabiting our Earth? Well, let's put it this way. I think that we always have had contact, um, interchange, with, I'll call them star beings. I kind of uh, prefer that name. It doesn't sound, somehow, well, I laugh when people talk about aliens, because now they're saying people from Mexico are aliens, and they aren't very alien. So I think that, um, you know, aliens from other planets are probably not so alien either. Um, so what my perspective is and the, what the story of the book, because I, I think of the book as a sacred history of planet Earth and the human race, and I think that we have had relations that probably our, our essence, our, that that's, those are our older brothers and sisters, um, though I think we on Earth have our place in this sort of um, continuum of life and that we probably have a very important role to play. We may not be the oldest race amongst all the stars, but I think we're very unique and the book kind of goes into a lot of those reasons and into that, into that relationship. And out of all the sites that you've been to, I mean, obviously you've had, you've had the honor and privilege of traveling to some um, beautiful ancient sites. I mean, I grew up in Central America and South America, so I too have had some experiences. I, I have not been to Egypt, and that is on, as I like to call it, my living list. Um, it, you know, I have been to some pretty amazing places in Central America and South America. What, what would you say is one of your more favorite places that you've been to in terms of the sacred sites? And, and why would you say that is one of your favorites? I mean, I think people all have a tendency to have had a, maybe a more a more beautiful experience at one site than another, whether it be that it touched you in a way that another site might have brought more tears to you or more joy to you, or just you had some sort of metaphysical experience that was more unique. What was one of your more favorite sites? Well, I think that there were actually three places for me, and um, one of them was the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, for me, the pyramids had a, an incredible feeling of familiarity. And as I've looked into my own ancient past, I can see why that is. So I won't go into more of that right now. But two other sites stand out. One was Tijuanaco, Bolivia, which is right near Lake Titicaca. It's right along just along the dividing line between Peru and Bolivia. And the site is very ancient. The um, local Indians that live in the area, the indigenous peoples, are called the Aymara. And their word for Tijuanaco means the place that was already here. So it has a very, it has a very ancient feel to it. And some really remarkable things about it in the site must have been very huge at one time. There's not that much of it that's left standing. But there is one area that I'm sure was, you can tell by the remnants, there were other structures. And when you look at the stonework, it's clear that actually 
molten um, metal was poured into parts of it to, to create fastenings. Um, I don't know how else exactly to say it, but it, there's, there's just evidence of really advanced technology. Technology that, uh, some of it, which we don't really have today at all. And some of the myths and legends about the place also have this very ancient stories and the book goes into some of this because that's one of the places where Cassie has some rather extraordinary experiences. And then my third place would be Callanish, Scotland, which is when people see the picture, pictures which are actually on the website, which I'll give to you later, um, they think it's Stonehenge because it's a number of like standing stones. However, it's um, Callanish is on an island called the Isle of Lewis, standing out in the North Atlantic Ocean at the very tip of Scotland. And it's this small island that's pretty much abandoned. There's a little town. Um, but these stones, too, have this feeling of being out there for so long. There's, there's something... Well, in the story, when Cassie goes there, she meets somebody who ends up being a very important character in the book named Mary, who really empowers Cassie in sort of in the beginning of understanding who she is. And Mary tells her, she said, you know, these ancient stones speak. And Cassie says, oh, what do you mean they speak? They talk to everybody? She said, no. They just speak to certain ones. They have a message that they want to carry out to the world. So this is a kind of, you come to some of these places, and there are three that I've named for me, and I think Callanish, you'd be pretty hard put not to be moved by whoever you are. There's just an aura about it. And I think you learn things. So those are my three. I think... Many places are magical for, like you said, individuals that are... Now, here's the thing. I think, first of all, and I've said this on so many different shows, we're all psychic. And, and the, the thing is, are you listening? So like you said, you go to the island, and like that lady said, they speak to certain ones. And I think what it boils down to is, like, are you listening? Have you ever hugged a tree? Oh, frequently. Okay. <laughs> There's now, I, I, I know people who say, like, hug a tree? And I tell people, now first of all, if you're going to hug a tree, make sure your feet are securely planted on the ground, right? And then when you hug the tree, people are like, okay, now I've done this experiment with a few people, and I'll say, okay, now hug the tree. And they're like, okay, now, now what? I said, can you feel the energy from the tree? And they're like, what? I'm like, okay, now, can you feel the pulse from the tree? And they're like, what? Right? They're like looking at me like I'm crazy, and I'm like, I'm in bliss because I can actually feel the union with the tree. I can actually feel the pulse of the tree. I can, you know, and, and I know others can, right? It's like, can you, like, literally be at union with the tree? Can you feel the pulse of the tree? Are you listening to the tree, right? Now, the funny part is when you, when you are in union with the tree and when you can feel the pulse of the tree, if you let go too fast, you fall on your butt. Because like you're, you've been in union with that tree, right? And the energy is so phenomenally beautiful and intense that you're like, when you get off the tree, you're kind of going like, woo, you know? You're like in this, you're like in this really heightened state because you've been in this like phenomenal ancient energy. I mean, you know, how old is a tree, right? It's like so when you go when you go to these sacred sites, it's like, are you present? Are you grounded? Can you hear? And you hear stories of people like literally talking to a rock. And I, now, what is the rock saying? You know, what is the ant saying? What is the frog saying? What is the first, you know, the fish saying? There are people that, you know, communicate with animals, that can communicate with trees, that can communicate with other beings. Whatever it is, is again, are you present enough to hear? And the kids that are growing up today, the indigos, the rainbows, the crystal children, more and more that we're labeling ADHD, schizophrenic, and all these other things when they're saying, well, you know, so-and-so told me to do this. When they're in interdimensionally, they're in between 
here and there, right, that we call them crazy when they're actually really hearing things from the other side or whatever you want to call it, it's because they're, they're choosing to communicate less and less is, is literally because they actually don't need to communicate as much because they're really communicating with or they're actually intercommunicating or they're actually telecommunicating with their parents. It, you know, it's really funny. They've actually done studies where the kids that are autistic and or have are, or even less communicating less, you'll see kids that won't talk from the time they're born till they're five and all of a sudden they're talking in full sentences. That's because they're like talking to the parents telepathically and the parents start thinking they just can't talk. It's not that at all. So they're talking telepathically the entire time. Have you seen and heard about this? Well, I have, yes, um, on a number of occasions. It's I, I, really fascinating. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think we're all energy sensitive. Exactly. I mean, it's just we're sort of li living in a time of, where, of heightened awareness. And I think it's available for all of us to become psychic, more psychic. I think that's our it's our nature, and that the times are really such that that is that's being speeded up. And thank God, <laughs> because you know we we've got some problems here on the planet, and it's about time we're able to understand one another and even read between the words and these kids that you're talking about I mean they're the ones in a sense who are going to save the planet so they need these skills and they're like the I believe sort of the next evolutionary leap and just when you said that that's what kind of came to me when you're saying like when you said you went to the island they're saying they speak to some so that's kind of what like really stood out for me when you said that and um, I do want to say to everybody that we are on Intention Radio, and I want to let everybody know that it's a beautiful station with people that are full of intention. Please make sure you do check out intentionradio.com. Please make sure you check out the intentioncall.com. They get together on Saturdays, and these are a group of people that are all about intention. And, you know, we're going to be here discussing more consciousness. We're going to be talking more about the beautiful book and I want Judith to please please Diana please let everyone know where they can find your beautiful book and we are on obviously on a podcast not just on a video show which will have our beautiful lower thirds with the information where they can find us so can you please let everyone know where they can find you via podcast right now sure well the book um, Amazon is always a good place <clears throat> uh, also, the website, which is the keeper of the diary book.com. And uh, you can see a lot of the images that are part of the story because Cassie, like me, is a photographer. And that's the main reason she starts on this original journey and continues on her other journeys. So, because Cassie and I. <clears throat> I wouldn't say she's my alter ego. I just say we have a lot in common. There are things I gave to Cassie that are part of my story. And then as she began to sort of evolve as an independent person, there are things that I began to learn from her and still am. Um, so at the, the website, which is the keeper of the diary book.com, um, you can go to the portfolio and you can see some of these places. You can see the standing stones of Kalanish. You can see Tijuanaco. You can see some of the things that happened in the camera that weren't planned but were so beautiful that I consider them gifts from the site. And what we'll be doing is we'll probably include in when I might put together that page. We'll probably put a couple of pictures in, and obviously we're gonna have links to everything. When the video comes out, we'll have we'll have the lower thirds that'll be there for everybody. So everything will be on there. And obviously with the podcast, we'll be saying several times throughout there where people can find your books, and we'll have the so everything. You know, don't worry. You'll be everybody will know where to find you, and they'll know where to find the links to everything. So that's the beautiful thing about video, and the beautiful thing about podcasts. That's why I love video and why I love podcasts because it gives people the opportunity to choose to listen or to watch. So um, I also want to find out, you know, 
were you th thinking about doing some workshops for people, or were you thinking of possibly turning this into a movie, or what are what are your thoughts or your what are your visions for the book and in visions for your characters, if you will? Well, that's a big question. Um, let me see. First, movie, absolutely. We've started talking to a few folks here and there. And like you said, it's a big book. Um, it could actually be a trilogy as a movie. You know, it could be three, three movies. Um, I think if I hadn't felt such a strong necessity that the book needed to be out now, and I'd have had more wiggle room, I actually might have written it as three books. Um, though it's a wonderful journey, it's a wonderful read the way that it is. Because Absolutely, you know, it really you, is. You just get so pulled in by, there's so many aspects to it, there's so many layers and levels. There's this diary that goes all the way back to the beginning of time and to focuses in on the civilization of Atlantis. And so there's many layers and levels and movie, it's very visual. So movie is top of the list, I think. Though we've actually started to get some book clubs and we're looking at workshops. Certainly the other book, which um, you love so much, Meditative Magic, is really ripe for workshops and um, there's so many philosophical things to explore, uh, ideas to explore in the Keeper of the Diary that I have, we've all really been encouraging people to form book clubs and I've even said that I would, you know, be on calls with them over Skype if that, that were to happen because it's, it's such a rich experience to share with other people. So we'll see where the workshops go. We've been talking about it, but nothing's formulated quite yet. Actually, what I was going to say is I was kidding about it being a thick book. It is a thick book, by the way. However, it is I don't a thick book. <laughs> I, would, I don't think I would change it. I think that, that you bringing it out as one like this, I think was perfect because I, I, just, I think it would have been different if you'd done it in three books. I think the fact that it is as one, it does envelop. It does bring you in. And and then now taking it, I think now bringing it, you know, into the movie and doing it that way. I think it did. I think you really did do it justice and keeping it as one. Because you okay. know what? If you think about it, when you're doing a diary, it is book. This is you know the when you're doing a diary, it's kind of like your life. This is kind of like a life. It's kind of like the story of a journey. And and that never is tiny. It's not I something do. that's small. It is something that's big. It is something that's powerful. Therefore, it would be something that's big. So I don't think it would have been as impactful if it had been into three. I think the fact that it is that it is like this is why it is so powerful. So I, I wouldn't have done it differently. I think you did it just right the way it is. Thank you. That's, that's great input. Um, no, I'm serious. Do you understand what I'm saying when I say yeah, that? No, no, no. Just because of the level of depth. And we haven't even talked about the various characters in it. I mean, there are some really... Strong. And, I, and, I, and I have, I've gone through, but you understand where I'm coming from when I yeah. say that? I, I think do. if you had broken it apart, it wouldn't have had that depth. It wouldn't have had that richness or, or that kind of weaving that it needed to do that. I think if you would broken it apart, it would have taken that away. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it would I, I think for me it's perfect. Yeah, I, I think movie-wise, though, three might be really good because don't forget Movie-wise, yes. Book-wise, no. Okay, cool. Does that make sense? <laughs> we always like to know we did things right. But you know, you know what I'm saying? From a movie yeah, I do. From a producer I do and a director, yes. From a movie, from a movie from, from a, I'm both. So I've been an author, you know, so, so from a, I, I, you know me, I work with both. I work with authors and I work with, and I'm a movie producer. So from a, from an author perspective, I think this was definitely the way to go, having worked with enough authors. From a movie producer director point of view, I can see both and. I think this is going to be really difficult to do as one movie. It However, would. from an author point of view, I think you did an excellent job. From an author point of view, um, from a movie producer director drive, I think this is going to be extremely hard to do as one as one movie because there's so much. There's so much. Um, so I think, as from a movie point of view, I think we can you know break this apart and do the 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 nuggets. Um, However, yeah. yeah, so I mean, I think there's a lot that can be done. 
and this is definitely going into a, a fun sacred geometry video. But like getting back to the other fun things we have, I, I definitely want to play with some more things though here. Sure. Um, I definitely want to want to get into. You no, know, we were talking about coincidences, and a lot of people don't understand coincidences. Do you think like because this is a intense conversation? Doubt some people believe. Some people believe there there are no coincidences. Some people believe in fate. Some people believe in dharma, karma, you know, all that type of things. What is your what is your belief, if you will? Coincidences, not. I mean, what are what is your thoughts on coincidences? Well, specifically on coincidences, I think there are no coincidences. Um, don't forget, you know, who we think we are. <clears throat> This, this person sitting here in this body, we're so much larger than that. So there's aspects of us that are that see a much bigger picture that are not part, we, we could say are part of our super conscious, but are not in our, in our band, band of conscious attention. So I, and I'm sure pretty much everybody's had the experience of looking back maybe at a period of their life where there seemed to be this strange thing that happened but it led to this other thing and then this other thing and it seemed like wow at the time it was almost overwhelming or confusing but then looking back you begin to see a road map like wow if this hadn't happened then that wouldn't have happened and if that wouldn't have happened and this next thing wouldn't have happened. And actually, there, semi early on in the book, when Cassie first arrives in Egypt, uh, there is a moment where she's kind of doing that, looking at the last year or so of her life and everything that brought her to Egypt, and, and some other things that I, I don't want to tell because I don't want to give any story points away. But she suddenly comes up and, and says to herself, there are just too many coincidences to be a coincidence. And I think that we've all had that experience, but generally not while it's going on. It's usually in retrospect that we begin to see there was a map, and we would have never arrived where we were if we'd have taken even one turn off the road. Our life would have gone in a different direction. I tend to, I tend to agree with you on that. I tend to believe that usually we are at the right place at the right time for our particular journey. I think that the universe will usually put us. It's, it's for example, I got I, I had I did an interview um yesterday and it was very fascinating how things turned out in the interview. Then he was he was bringing up, uh, you know nine eleven. He thought it was very fascinating how on nine eleven of all all days, you know nine eleven meaning SOS or kind of nine eleven meaning you know kind of help a cry for help for the world type of thing. And a lot of people actually. Have had that analogy about 9/11. Think about you know the world disaster of all days have a world disaster. Why on 9/11, which 911 you know on our phones mean you know 911 uh, help hello help right? And I looked back you know at at my kind of lineage in my life and as you know the story of my life my initials were SOS my birth initials yes right. And as you know, my history is I grew up with what I grew up with, and I and and I as a very at a very young age, I always wanted to change my name because of that. I knew what I grew up with, and I and then as a child, I always would I always be telling you know teachers or nuns like what was going on. They didn't believe me, and I was kind of like you know please get me the hell out of here, like get you know like get me out of this, like this isn't you know. And it was funny because the more I would actually dial 911, the more trouble I would get into. So I made a conscious decision. And by the way, I was driving, to, and I worked at World Trade Center. So I was mm. literally on my way to work on 911. And, you know, I got to the train station, and we all knew each other. And by coincidence, you know, of all things, my client calls me the night before and he says to me, you know, um, I, I'm gonna be. I'm staying at the beach house one more day, so you know I'm gonna cancel my appointment with you. And normally I would have gone to work. I would have still gone to work at the same time, regardless if I had that appointment or not. I would have just worked out. So I would have just, you know, and um, I didn't. I chose to sleep in an extra hour. So I got to the train station. And I'm like, hey, you're not going to work today. 
you're, 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 you know, we, we can't get you in. We had to take the path train, whatever. But you know, so I would have been right smack in the middle of it all. And so I made a conscious choice that day to legally change my name. Because so many times, time and time and time and time again, I, sh I literally have been in situations when, by all rights, and I, you know me, I don't like to use the word should, I should have been dead. And yet I was alive every time when I should have been dead. And so every time I get to a point, you get to a place when I get to an intersection, there'd be an accident, or this happened, or that happened, or another situation, you know, from, you know, whatever, and my initials were still SOS, and, you know, all the stuff was going on, and I always missed the accent, or this is, I finally said, you know what, after 9-11 and I missed that, I'm like, you know what, I'm legally changing my name. So for my birthday present, you know, whatever, I legally changed my name. You know, I was like, okay, I've had it. And the funny part was when I legally changed my name, I didn't know, you know, how I'm about butterflies. I didn't know my birth, my birth name numerology wise was transformation, was a number five. Well, when I changed my name, and I went and some lady that I know that does numerology, she goes, you know, you changed your name to a number five again. Which which I was like, why? That's why I always like butterflies. It's all about transformations. You know, like I changed my name again and I, I always love cats. So I, I wanted to change my name. And again, that's why I thought about you. You know, you're talking about Egypt and cats, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. My, my initial C A T. Cat, when I changed my name, was from Cat, because all my friends called me Cat anyway. So I sat down one day, you talk about coincidences, I sat down one day, and literally Carly Alyssa Thorne came to me as plain as day. So I said, okay, Carly Alyssa Thorne it is. So I went and changed my name legally. I go see my friend. She goes, oh, you're a number five. And I never knew my previous name was a five. No clue. Mm -hmm. So you talk about coincidences, coincidences, coincidences. My birth name was a five. My new name is a five. My butterfly logo has always been a butterfly logo. Talk about transformations. Well, so again, we're on so many levels. <laughs> right. So there are no coincidences. I mean, how how many more coincidences did I need to not know that I didn't have to know that I needed to? You know, it's like again, life will 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 again. There are no coincidences. None. That's that's my feeling, and that's really as. Um, I mean, I thought I thought that'd be a perfect example. I mean, that's like as 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 God could throw you any more darts to let you know that it's like there are no coincidences. <laughs> and I thought today was a perfect story. It's nine eleven, so I thought that'd be a perfect story to share. The good nine eleven story. Nine eleven mm -hmm. today, you know. And I I, I worked at nine eleven, and we're talking about coincidences. And I'm like, if that is not a coincidental story about nine eleven, and someone telling you, like, honey, you have no no choice but just to go. It's like so. Anyways, that blessings to everybody who's been a part of 9/11 in any shape or form. Um, you know, and um, I I would love for you to share um, another one that I really love for you to share about. You know, the main character Cassie is half Arab and half Jewish. How did that come about? Well, that came about very consciously. Um, and, and that's a very interesting combination. That's why I ask. Well, I figure that seems to be one of the big divisive points in our on our planet right now. This sort exactly. of exactly. Um, that's why I brought it up. So I figure best way to deal with that is to marry these two polar opposites, as many people see it, into one character. And this one character who happens to be the heroine and on the heroine's journey. <clears throat> it seemed to be a pretty powerful statement about the possibilities. And um, both of these lineages play a part in, in, in her character's development as well as a much larger lineage that she finds out as the story goes, goes along. So a lot, some of the story, actually a lot of the story takes place in the Middle East, um, in Egypt and in Israel. And these are sort of, again, these two counterpoints, and yet they, they come together in Cassie, this heroine. Yeah, I, I think one of the things I also love about books like this is that you can take world issues 
and use a book or use a character and help the world through a book like this. And there's nothing, I think there's nothing more beautiful than using a book to help solve, or not necessarily solve, help bring to light ways of solving issues. Or You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that people, you know, really, I know that I do. I always, I, I get really caught up in stories. And if it's a good story, and if the characters are well drawn, I get very pulled in and I learn things on many different levels without even being conscious of it, without trying. I mean, I think nonfiction books are great. You know, they have their place and we learn a lot of things through them. But for me personally, there's nothing like a good story with meaning behind the things that happen or a good movie to really get me thinking about things in new ways. And that was my objective with this book, for sure. Now, your book is a very unique, it is, it's a very unique book. So how would you say, how would, it, how would I describe this book genre-wise to people? Because I, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily, I wouldn't put it in, in the genre of just spiritual. I wouldn't put it in the exact category of self-development. I don't think I'd put it in a genre of classical romance. So what would you say is the genre of the book? Well, I call it visionary fiction. And um, quite honestly, we stole that from Paulo Coelho, who wrote The Alchemist, and which is another one of those books. That's a, it's a small book, and it's a story, but it's a story with so much, so many levels behind it. And that was my goal with this book, um, was to be able to plant new new visions. So to see a bigger picture, what is, what is a visionary? A visionary can see the possibilities in any situation, can see the possibilities for the future. Um, so and, and to me, that's what this time period that we're in is all about. And this book speaks to that specifically, which is why it's out now, although it was in process for almost 25 years. Uh, it was clear to me that it didn't, it didn't complete itself until now because now was when it would be able to speak to the most people. And what would you say, like to audiences that, like you say, you waited this long to, to put it out. So what would you say is going to be the biggest takeaway for someone? For so, like, what would you say to the? Now I want to, I want to say to. I'm trying, I'm trying to find the right words here. So young, like literally to the younger population of people that are coming out, like the, you know, the, there's kind of like you got the older population of spiritual people and you got the younger, younger mid-generational, I say the people in their 20s that are seeking spirituality. What would be the message you put out to the younger ones? Because that's, that's to me, that's the younger generation of kids that are coming up that, for me anyways, those are the ones that I'm really wanting to reach and get them to wake up to consciousness, if you will. So how do we reach the kids that are in their 20s to wake them up and to, you know, really reach them right now? Well, I, I, I think the book has many messages and probably the most... And what would be the... Well, okay, okay, now I know the words I'm looking for. So from this book right here, what would be the character that you would think that would speak to the younger mid-20s mid kids? Well, Cassie. You know you have a character that would, so that's why I'm asking. Well, Cassie. I mean, Cassie carries the story. You yeah. Know? Cassie's thought. in her early 30s, and she, you know, especially for women, though for men as well, but certainly for younger women, she becomes somebody to identify with. You see the way she changes in the book. In She changes, I mean, it's not, it, it's not her idea to change. She fights it tooth and nail. But as she reads the diary and some of the ideas put forward, and one of the biggest ideas is choice, is that it, it's, we're, we're always at choice points and that we always do have a choice. And somebody said, like, you know, choice is great, but if you don't know you have it, then you don't have it. It's just may as well not exist. And I think that that's perhaps the strongest message for our times is that 
we have choices and that every choice we make, even small ones, so you're talking about younger people, understanding sort of that just because things have been done one way or just because they've been brought up to think in a particular way, as they mature and go out into the world, they're faced with choices every day. And every one of those choices affects not only their own personal life, but because we're all connected, the interconnection of all life, every little choice we make affects everyone and everything. And I think understanding this thing about choice, but also about interconnection, that's going to be really the key to our future. And that's probably the strongest message that somebody can take away from this book is to realize, to be empowered, to, to make even little choices in their own life, to know that when they're, when they're, should I go this way, should I go that way, well, look at the bigger picture. How will it affect other people? You know, I, I think that's becoming our spiritual growth now. It's not just about me, it's about us. Because this is getting to be a smaller and smaller planet. And by the very fact that we're doing this show and who will it reach over the internet, we are all interconnected. So the choices we make are the choices that are creating our future. Now, the other interesting part that you said is like, yes, we are all interconnected. The other interesting part is what you're describing, at least for me anyway, that is the ripple effect. And that's what people don't get. And that's why it's like we are all interconnected, and it is the ripple effect. So what we do is the ripple effect. Every choice that we make is the ripple effect. And that's what I keep on, you know, the, the paying it forward, everyone keeps talking about paying it forward. It's not the paying it forward that creates the ripple effect. It's the choices we make that creates the ripple effect. So that's what we keep on need. That's the thing. That's the message we keep on needing to remind people. Yes, paying it forward is great, and I love paying it forward. I'm always attempting to and and helping people and doing things for people. It's the choices we make, though. Every single choice we make, every word that we say, it's not. It's not just the doing. It's the choices because before you actually do. And that, so that's the trail, though. That's what people keep on forgetting. Choices lead to doing. <laughs> so, so before we get to the doing part, it's the choosing. And I, the yeah, I want to take that even a step further. Go ahead. It's even the way we think. Yes. Because so it is. We it are. Is we are. It's a choice. I'm gonna actually. You know what? You just. You just. You just gave me a wonderful idea. Yay. So oh, I'm yeah. actually going to create a graphic with the thinking, then the choosing, then the doing. So I actually, you know, you see my graphic with the ripple effect, right? So I'm going to actually have my, my editor uh, take my graphic that I designed, and I'm actually going to have them put in there now the, the thinking, then the choosing, then the doing, and through the ripples. Because I already have the ripples. So in the ripples, I'll actually put the words of the thinking then the choosing within the doing within the ripples. That would be so cool. You gave me a brilliant idea. Thank you. But you're, you're right. right. <laughs> you know, because I keep on I get really frustrated. People are they're always focused on paying it forward. And it's great. I love the concept and I'm all for paying it forward. I just you know it reminds me so much though because we can't even get to that phase yet. Because we're you know we, we still have to get through the thinking and the choosing first before we even can even get even near there. So that well, that's, that's a true. Really I mean, the, idea. the the choosing certainly paying it forward comes out of making a choice. Yes, exactly. Um, so, but the reason I go back to it's even what we think is we tend to forget who we really are. You yes, know, this is the peace. This is the peace. Who we are is we are energy beings. Yep. Living in an energetic universe, certainly on an energetic planet, where everything everything is energy. So everything affects everything. You know, we know this from science, that the idea of the observers of an experiment can actually change the outcome of that experiment. And this is, we're talking about physical reality, which so many people think of as being fixed. And don't... Malleable. Yes, it's so malleable. It's so malleable. Uh, that this is something 
the book is so much about this because Cassie learns how energy sensitive she is as the story goes on and she understands this concept and begins to respond, not react, but respond to different situations in that way. And each of these little choices, like you just said, each of these choices change her and change, okay, this book is a container and she changes things. The, the way that this book would come out would be very different if Cassie didn't make some of the choices she made. It would be a completely different book. That's a good example. What you said was just so brilliant. I'm so excited. I can't wait to call. I can't wait to make the call <laughs> and do those changes. I'm like really excited about that. And as usual, you and I just get lost. I told you, I, I, it's a good thing I'm actually looking at uh, time. Anyways, we are on Attention Radio. We are on attentionradio.com. And as usual, me and Diana, we could just go into like another consciousness and another dimension, and we could like talk for days. So uh, I really do need to bring love and light to Intention Radio because without Intention Radio, we would not be having this conversation. So um, we do need to bring some love and light to Intention Radio and make sure that you know that we are airing on IntentionRadio.com. Please be sure to check out IntentionCall.com on Saturdays. And um, as usual, everybody, uh, you do know that I'll be putting together a page that will have an embedded video. We'll have an embedded podcast. And I, I do absolutely love your feedback. If you have anything you would love to hear about, please let us know. Uh, Diana, please let everyone know where they can find you and find your book. And, um, and I, I am just so delighted always to have you and talk to you and hear your brilliant mind as you always entice in me some more brilliance to um, think about and come away with more wonderful ideas. So please share it with everyone where they can find the... the Anyway, just so you know, her books actually do say Judith Diana Winston. It says that we lovingly call her Diana. So, um, Diana, can you please let everyone know where they can find your beautiful books? Well, sure. You can find uh, The Keeper of the Diary very easily on Amazon. And both books are you can find on thekeeperofthediarybook.com. <clears throat> and, of course, it features The Keeper of the Diary. But there's also a page that will say Glyph Book. And it will go into meditative magic. Uh, and as you said, I wanted to mention this, that although the Glyph book is a separate book, and it actually popped out while the Keeper of the Diary was still being written, those glyphs are very much a part of the story, as much as Cassie's photography is a part of the story. These glyphs and, and their story of entering the world become encompassed in her story and end up playing not only a personal role for her but a role in the book itself so they're very intertwined and well, so I want to I want to show everybody what one of the glyphs look like they're, they're just absolutely really powerful and beautiful and um, you can uh, literally meditate on them and then, then they have seed sounds on the back of them there's a description of the glyphs and then they have a seed sound um, they're really, they're really. I mean, I've been having a blast with them. They're, um, they're absolutely really beautiful, and they have, they have the pronunciations of them on the back, and there's, and there's, there's, it, there's a whole package of them, uh, beautifully designed. Um, I'm, I have my own kind of little dream with them right now about making them into a sacred, sacred uh, geometry video and making them in color. That's kind of something that I think would be really beautiful, but they're they're absolutely really beautiful. Um, it comes with a, a full a full book. It has um, a whole a whole book um, and beautiful design cover. I'm in love with the cover. Uh, they will dance for you when you meditate on them. So yeah, I mean it's a really powerful book. I really encourage you to go on her site and go look at the pictures from the sacred sites that she was on. Uh, it's a really, I mean, the site is beautiful. The book is beautiful. Diana's beautiful. Um, <laughs> she is. She is. Uh, anyways, we we have unfortunately uh, run out of our beautiful airtime. I I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I will I will have uh, have her on as a guest again. So for now we leave you. However, I'm sure, I, like I said, I'm I'm sure me and her will be having plenty of other conversations. So I'm sure this won't be the very last. Anyways, for tonight, I leave you. I love you guys. Um, many blessings. 
Uh, I do send out my love and light to the people from 9-11, although this episode is not going to air on 9-11, although today is 9-11. We just happen to be recording on 9-11, so I want to emphasize that. Today is 9-11. I just want to send out my blessings to everybody. We are recording on 9-11, however, this won't air on 9-11. So um, just many blessings to everybody, and um, lots of love and blessings. And for tonight, I leave you, so good night for now. And thank you so much for joining me again. And um, as most people don't know, we are recording this again because we wanted to get some more, some other stuff that we wanted to just address. So anyways, thank you for coming back, Diana. Oh, well, thank you. It's my pleasure again. Carla. All right. So good night for now. See you all later. Have a great night, everybody.